here to introduce you. I just got assigned and I said, oh, I'll introduce myself. Um, I won't make you do that. I'm Linda Porter. I'm one of the separate juvenile court judges in Lancaster County. And I, uh, this is a big turnout. I thought uh, with the Kansas judges, I'd get a real small group. So, um, But I'm going to talk about permanency hearings and how they should be different from review hearings. But before I do that, I want to kind of get a poll of what all perspectives are represented here and what percentages. So I'll try to at least hit all of them. How many judges? I recognize a lot of you guys, so. Okay, how many uh, attorneys, parents or children? Oh, lots of attorneys, okay. How about caseworkers or supervisors for the Department of Health and Human Services? Not very many, that does not surprise me because they, get, they don't like to hear about me. <laughs> they hear from me enough, so that doesn't totally surprise me. So, oh, there's a list of we got a new representative of the department. In some ways that's too bad because they're a critical part of permanency hearings, but um, I'm going to do my best in terms of talking about it, but that we can do it this uh, interactively, and it's a lot more interesting, I think, if people ask questions or offer, offer ideas or things you're experiencing or doing, at least that's my experience. Okay, um, I've got some, oh, they, they give me the directions, and these are really basic. I am not a PowerPoint person, so bear with me. Um, before we get started, I, I just want to ask how many of you are sort of combining, in your jurisdictions, do you combine permanency hearings with just a, a review hearing? Pretty standard, okay. Um, that's what we historically have done a lot in Lancaster County. We've moved, at least some of us, to setting specific permanency hearings. Um, for, the, for the goal of, of focusing it on that issue as opposed to just it being a, a review of well, where are things in the case and oh by the way what's the permanency plan for the children. But anyway I'm going to start with the, my PowerPoint in terms of some just basic background information. Uh, the relevant statute and uh, this is 431312. Every child in foster care under the supervision of the state is required to have a permanency hearing by a court no later than 12 months after the date the child enters foster care and then annually thereafter, once a year after that, um, during the whole time the child's in foster care. I don't think permanency hearings are required if the kids are at home. And my position is whether they're with a parent or either parent. Um, I mean, it doesn't hurt, you aren't, uh, you know, there's no problem with doing so, but I don't think they're required in terms of the statute uh, or uh, for funding issues, okay? And for timing, purpose, timing issues, um, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people just set their permanency hearing 12 months from the date of removal. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But you do have a little a leeway. Under the statute, for purposes of timing the permanency hearing, a child is deemed to have entered foster care on the earlier of the date of the first judicial finding that the child has been subjected to uh, abuse or neglect. That's the date the court takes jurisdiction not the temporary custody hearing, but the date you make a finding. We call it an adjudication hearing. Other people call it other things. But it's the date the court says this is an abuser, neglected, or dependent child. Or the date that is 60 days after the date on which the child is removed from the home. So if, if your adjudication comes pretty early on in the case, then use that date. But if uh, you're like some of us have periodically been where a case lingers for a while before there's an adjudication finding, um, it's continued or you have a contested hearing and trial, um, then it's uh, 60 days from the date of removal. What I do in terms of setting permanency hearings, which has been helpful, is on the date of adjudication, my adjudication order, I set a permanency hearing. Because I know that date, whether it's <coughs> that date or it's 60 days from removal, I can look at when the child was removed and if it was a couple weeks earlier then. And in that adjudication order, um, I just set the permanency hearing. Um, a year from that date, and if the kids are returned home later, I, I cancel it. It's, it's always out there, and it's uh, in the board, court's order of adjudication. And that's, I think all the judges in Lancaster County are, are doing that, and it works pretty well. Because you, you've got a calendar if you need it, and unfortunately, a lot of times you do need it if kids are here after 12 months. Um, okay, this is kind of, I mentioned this earlier, and I apologize. Sorry. Um, separate permanency hearing versus jointly held with uh, a review hearing. You know, re review hearings are required to be held every six months by statute, and so it's very tempting to 
combine them you know, with, um, so that you don't have to have an extra pairing in there. Uh, I would really urge you to think about not doing that so that you have a hearing that is specifically um, dedicated to, to permits and issues. Look at how much yes. difference is there typically in the evidence. At that point in time, isn't, isn't your extended review here, the first one is you've got some time now, the family's been out, and so on and so forth, isn't the evidence you've got to review the hearing, what that you're going to get in the permit center? <laughs> what, what, what other evidence are you getting? Clearly. Um, one of the things that I don't think this is a good question to ask you all because I never know what goes on in the rest of the state. In um, Lancaster County now, the protocol is, for a permanency hearing is they have to do a separate permanency report. And they can offer a case planning report, report under their usual format, but they do a sep the caseworkers do a separate permanency planning report, which is usually several pages long and it details the whole progress of the case from start to finish and details all the services they've provided, what the parents have done or not done, and they set forth specifically the plan. I get that, I get that in, in, the, in the court report. court report portion of the court report case typically will have step by step, you know, a history of what's taking place. If they've got intensive finding preservation, you know, how that's gone, and so on and so forth. And again, I guess I'm questioning maybe, maybe you're getting Maybe you're getting plans that are better than ours te have tended to be, but it, it's, it's caused, I think, at least in our jurisdiction, people to focus on, okay, if I'm going to go in there and reckon, <coughs> what we were getting before was just standard permanency plan is reunification, even though we're 12 months or 14 months after this child was removed. Uh, with no indication that anybody really thought about it other than just you know, typical review. Yeah, just, yeah, reunification. And, and nobody was ever recommending anything but um, reunification, generally speaking, unless the parents uh, were ready to consent to a guardianship or affirmatively consenting to something. Yeah. Linda, as a practical matter, when you're in the outside the separate juvenile court atmosphere, it's really difficult to get all the players together for multiple hearings. If you've got them in the room, use them. Plus, we have that adult docket that's sitting either side of juvenile that you got to get done. So it's it's more of a, a county expense too because they're paying the lawyers well, then to be there. One suggestion I'd make is then at least not really bifurcate it, but say we're going to address permanency first. Then, if there's any additional evidence, but I, I want to address this. I do it opposite. I do the court reporting case plan, and then we take that permanent. So maybe okay. I should. But I, I just urge you, if, if, <coughs> if it's going to be a meaningful hearing, if you want to focus the department on looking at it as that, as opposed to just oh well, you know. Oh, and by the way, here's our permanent plan. That you know, promoting the idea that the primary purpose is permanent. We'll review the case generally as well, um, but. Um, it's been helpful to, to do it just permanency because I get a report that is directed just to those issues and um, is reflecting more process before the hearing. And that's, it's, that's the unfortunate part of uh, not having enough, uh, a lot of caseworkers here is um, I really think pre-hearing, it's a pre-hearing conference, and I think there's a breakout session sometime during uh, this conference on a jurisdiction and is somebody here that's uh, using pre-hearing conferences before the permanency hearing, which I think is a great idea because uh, it gets people in a less formal situation, but presumably uh, before the permanency hearing, and it, it ought to be more than just the day before, the, the day of or a half an hour before, uh, but gets people together to really talk about, okay, if, if reunification <coughs> is the plan, what's the timeline over the next 90 days, for instance? because you're going to have an exception issue at 15 months. So presumably um, that 90-day period is critical in what, you know, what's going to happen by X day, what's going to happen by 60 days. Um, and those kinds of discussions, I think, ought to be held in a conference before the parent gets the report the day of the hearing or two days before and learns what the department's permanency plan is. So, um, I would urge the department and the litigants and a lot of these attorneys to, to think about, you know, asking for a pre-hearing, for a conference, a 
or a team meeting or attending a team meeting if the issue of permanency is going to be discussed so that the permanency hearing has some input from your client. If your client still wants to pursue reunification, really talking about what steps, what, what do they need to do and what's the time frame uh, that's reasonable under the circumstances. Um, just a suggestion that a conference before the, uh, the permanency hearing I think can be really helpful to the process and also result in a report that's, that's got everybody's input into it. And, you know, nobody, people may not agree or not. People may not agree, but at least there'll be some input. Okay, in terms of preparation uh, for uh, permanency hearing, and a lot of this is taken from the resource guidelines, so it's, it's all in there, but these are the things that I thought. Some of them I picked out because I thought they were the most important things. <coughs> I really think before you go into a permanency hearing, you ought to review the file in its entirety. Judge or a, an attorney, you ought to know what's what's happened in the case. And sometimes you've had it from beginning to end. Sometimes, uh, whether it's a judge or an attorney, you haven't. So you really ought to uh, familiarize yourself fully uh, with when the child was first removed, whether you know, whether there's a tribal issue. You should know well before then. But the number and the nature of the child's placements, the reasons for move, each move, the case plan detail, progress reports, and this may involve uh, looking at at back case plans and court reports and other reports by professionals. And then if you have a CASA or um, certainly you always have a guardian ad litem look at their reports, reports from foster parents. How many of you are getting the um, caregiver information forms uh, from foster parents on a regular basis these days? Good. I think they're, personally, I think they're a real good resource. They really, for one thing, they tell me if the guardian ad litems visited the child, which is a new piece of information that in my jurisdiction has been helpful. Um, but they also give you a sense of the child. And I love the pictures. And in fact, I, I started recently saying, I want to take the picture, even though they're offered as an exhibit and they go in the exhibit file, I ask the attorneys if I can take the picture off and create a big collage in my office of kids. Um, it helps um, to see the children that you're expecting. So, um, reviewing those things. Um, these are things that I really think a judge and the, the, the attorney should be looking at before the hearing um, so that you have a sense of what are the questions I should be asking. And it, it does take some extra time, but you know, it's once a year. It's, it seems to me it's uh, Okay, other parties. Again, here, uh, the pre-hearing, pre-permanency hearing conference or team meeting. And you know, maybe a team meeting if everybody's holding those and they're required um, that would be sufficient. But I don't know how often attorneys go to team meetings. In my jurisdiction, it's kind of admit some of them do and some of them don't. Um, but it might be uh, a team meeting that deals with a permanency uh, hearing, upcoming permanency hearing, ought to be, might be a time when attorneys really can make a difference. And particularly in pushing for, for time issues, timing issues. I don't think that's something any of us address a lot and enough. Um, I heard uh, Judge Key yesterday when he talked to just the judges uh, talk about um, a practice he uses that I took some notes on and said, that's really good. He has, he uses it from early on in a case, but he has milestones. He has specific time issues when things are to happen by. He also uses a milestone kind of format for visitation um, where he orders, if he's ordering supervised visitation, he orders a move, I think, paraphrasing, so I don't, I'm not positive, that he, he has sort of a default that the case moves to monitor visitation and overnights with a certain time frame that happens unless somebody says, wait a minute, we've got some problems, as opposed to the way at least it's tended to work in my jurisdiction where nobody moves to the next level until the next court hearing, which, you know, if it's three or six months later, is a lot of time, so he, he builds sort of time frames into a lot of his orders. And um, what were some of those? Like how, how much time? Did they were they were surprisingly short. At least what I remember him talking about is like 30 days. You know, visitation is fully supervised for 30 days and going well <coughs> without problems. Then it moves to monitor, and 30 days after that, adds overnights as long as the parents have a stable. I mean, it's doesn't, I mean, it can be based on the case and based on other progress, but he builds those kinds of timelines into things, into his orders, um, that I, I really think makes some sense. So this is something positive that I got out of 
his uh, presentation yesterday. And really, uh, with regard to a permanency hearing, I think could come out of a, an order, if the court's going to approve continued efforts to reunification, or reunification is the permanency goal, spelling <coughs> out and the parent shall accomplish this by within the next 30 days, or the next 60 days, or whatever. Linda, Lancaster County, don't, don't, doesn't the Department of Health and Human Services make some of those same kinds of decisions? In terms of visitation? So they have flexibility in making decisions about visitation and permitting overnight visitation? I don't think they feel they do. They feel um, they recommend very specific visitation, usually, supervised visitation. We, we have moved to a system now where they will ask us to approve. Uh, move to monitor visitation with 10 days advance notice to all parties. That's kind of our standard provision. And um, so that provides the flexibility of not needing a stipulation to be presented in court or a, a, a hearing. But boy, they, they tend not to move without the court saying yes or all the parties saying yes. And maybe that's yeah, not I, the case I elsewhere. Well, I guess we do it more informally. We let, let, let them work it out. And then if they can't work it out, then they come back and ask for a specific visitation. So do you just order reasonable visitation? Yeah. See, I'm really hesitant to do that because I think there's some Supreme Court case law that in Nebraska that says it's a delegate. Well, now you're going to throw the law. It's an yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were doing so well. Now you want us to obey the law. Well, I think it is sort of an abdication of, of judicial oversight or responsibility to say <coughs> visitation to be determined by the caseworker or the psychologist. But it's not determined by the caseworker, it's determined by the parties. I mean, they're all represented. At well, we, yeah, it may depend on. I mean, I, I recognize we have different cultures, but um, I I set a I don't set a specific visitation schedule. I don't say Monday, Wednesday, Thursday for a minimum of you know, from 3:30 to 5:30. That's unworkable and that's way too micromanaging. But I tend to do you know minimum of three times a week, or you know, it depends on the ages of the kids. And, and I know there's a breakout, and I urge some of you to go to it by Linda Sem, judge them on visitation issues. I'm aware of the work that committee's done, and it's, it's really interesting and really helpful. But we tend to order a minimum visitation um, and designate whether it's supervised, monitored, or unsupervised, and whether overnights are approved or not approved. Um, but, so, but if you, you know, you're working with a more flexible system and nobody's you know, appealed you or complained, then you know, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do it otherwise. We just have been in a system where we don't, nothing tends to move unless the judge says move and so the more you can spell things out as, as a default in your order it will at least provide that flexibility so, uh, but anyway I, I would urge you to uh, consider either having pre-hearing conferences or going to team meetings and at, before the permanency hearing or before the 12 month review hearing and, and permanency hearing to uh, to talk about what the department's plan is going to be and how, how your client Yes. Okay. This is the. Uh, these are the uh, gui resource guidelines suggestions as to questions that the court should ask at a permanency hearing. And one of the things that I'm just doing recently, and part of it was to try to make my hearings end on time, because um, I was running late a lot, um, is. Review hearings or permanency hearings. I now have a protocol where the exhibits get uh, offered and received first, and then I call the case. I, I put them under oath and I ask some questions that <coughs> I want to know from having read the reports. I used to wait till the very end, but I found that I was a lot of times too irritated. <laughs> and I was conveying <laughs> that irritation. <laughs> and whereas if I ask at the beginning, I'm a little it's, it's nicer. <laughs> At least I think I am nicer. Um, but it, it also tell it, it saves time because if you let them, we were previously I was always letting the parents' attorneys start with the question, and um, that would a lot of times take a lot of time. We used to let the county attorneys start with the question, and that would be caseworker on direct examination for the whole half an hour, hour, or whatever time. So I've gone to a system where I ask I ask the, the questions that I have right off the bat. Um, and it 
this help? Because sometimes it tells the attorneys, the judge is worried about this, or the judge is not worried about this, and so I don't have to waste a lot of time about it. But I, I feel like it's, it's the judge's opportunity. Um, all these other people have all these conversations in all sorts of other situations, including team meetings, out in the hall, conferences, or whatever. It's, it's the only time I get to ask any questions about what's going on in the case. So um, I don't know how the attorneys feel about it, but I don't think I'm acting as irritated with the case workers. So <laughs> hopefully it's got at least that benefit. But at a permanency hearing, I really do think it's, it's appropriate for the court to, um, and some of you all don't swear your case workers in. That's, that's totally up to you. I do it so that it's evidence. But um, I, I recognize a lot of people are much more informal and I don't think there's any problem with that. But I ask the questions that I want to ask and I think at a permanency hearing it really is uh, appropriate and there's nothing wrong with the court directing some of that question. Um, have the con uh, so these are the questions that um, they suggest you ask. What are the child's special needs? And um, you know, I think as long as that isn't going to take up a lot of time at the hearing, if you you might you want to put it at the end or the beginning, but it's, it's certainly something to be aware of and to, to know about uh, if it hasn't been presented to you previously through a lot of evidence and review hearings. But if, if the department's recommending reunification, these are the questions that I think the court should ask. How the conditions adjudicated been corrected? I mean, what's the reasons the child was brought into care? Have they are they corrected, or are they substantially corrected, or are we well on their way to being corrected such that reunification is, is likely in the near future? And what, if anything, needs to be done uh, in the meantime? And that, you know, if there's anything to take away from that, I think that's that's critical. I, I was finding that at permanency hearings, they'd come in and say, yeah, reunification's the plan, Judge. And I think, well, how are we going to get there? What if we, what if, you know, how is this relating to why these children were removed? You know, sometimes it's it's simple. It's 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 pretty straightforward. If the parent, if kids were removed because of the parents' use of drugs, and they're still actively using and visiting occasionally, if at all, I mean, I would hope that you might not get a recommendation, a permanency plan of reunification if there's been no progress whatsoever. Uh, but a lot of our cases are are not quite as clear cut, and it really is a situation that I think that judges and attorneys, if the attorneys are doing the questioning, ought to really flush out with the caseworker of where are we? If reunification's the plan, uh, where are we in that process? What needs to be done? And have the, the reasons the child was removed been adequately addressed that, that we can, uh, there's a minimal standard of parenting or a minimal standard of safety uh, that we can, we can look at? Uh, what's the and, and if reunification is the plan, I've been asking this a lot recently. All right, well, when's the child going home? And I get a look from these case workers like, I don't know. <laughs> and it's like, well, we're this is 12 or 14 months after removal. When? You know, is it 30 days? Is it 90 days? Is it six months? Or is it another year? And and those, it really stumps a lot of people, and, and that's telling, I think, in terms of whether it's a realistic plan. And um, <coughs> hopefully, if you start asking a lot of these questions at a permanency hearing, you'll get better preparation in terms of reports, and the caseholders will be more prepared to ask some of those questions, particularly if they really are recommending <coughs> reunification still at 12 and 14 months. Um, you know, once you get past that, what are the services that are that need to? Oh, if, well, actually, the next point is different. Okay, if re, if the child's going to be returned home, and sometimes they come in at the permanency hearing, and that's the, the lately I've been getting some of these. I think because they have that sense of 12 months. Okay, maybe we'll put these kids back home, um, and and the permanency hearing becomes a placement change hearing mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but what are you going to? What are services are going to be put in place now? to monitor the child's safety in the home and to ease with the transition. So um, be sure if that's either imminent, happening that day, or within the next 30 days, you know what the department's uh, plan is in terms of in-home services or services to help with that transition. And then why is reunification in the best interest of the child? You know, questions about what's the child's relationship with the parent like, 
How does the child feel? Does the child know that this is what you're proposing? And, and what are their feelings and what are their concerns? Um, those are questions that, at least with kids that can talk, they, they should be able to, should answer and should have addressed in that work they do before they come into a permanency hearing. Okay. Um, termination of parental rights and adoption is recommended. Oh, the, uh, one thing I want to tell you guys is about 2018 to 12. I did. I waived the, or gave up the right to have them give me the one minute, to five minute, twenty minutes. So when we're getting close to 12:15, I think somebody give me the old. <laughs> I can go on. Um, <coughs> okay, um, when you get a permanency report that recommends uh, adoption, termination of parental rights, when do you get those very often? Okay. I'm getting more of them, though I, I think the department sometimes does not What do you do when you get uh, the recommendation for uh, concurrent permanency planning? Let's say the recommendation is reunification with a concurrent recommendation of adoption with the polar office. Sure. Everybody gets confused, particularly the parents and their lawyer, about what are you doing here? You're recommending reunification at the same time you're recommending adoption. What do you do with those questions? You ask questions about both theories, and then the department, I think, takes the position that they have to recommend those things until the termination of rights <coughs> of the petition is filed, and then they can go with adoption. But until then, they have to recommend something. Yeah, else. that's been my understanding is the department takes it. Administratively, have been told you can't recommend adoption uh, unless there's been a termination filed. Um, I, I do get that, and I, I make find permanency findings. So I ask the questions sort of on both sides of it. it it's hard when you're going to be the trier of fact on any termination. Um, you don't want to. You're careful to try not to tip your hand as to what um, you think should happen or what you might be inclined to think should happen. Uh, but I, I have approved concurrent planning for uh, of both continued efforts at reunification and adoption. And, and that's when, quite frankly, any child that's been out of the home 12 and 14, or 12 or 14 months, and I'm using those two figures because of the timing issue, they ought to be doing concurrent planning. And that's a long time for children to be out of the home. Do you think those should be on the very first baseline? The concurrent planning? Absolutely. Well, good question because <laughs> it doesn't have to be, and I, I, you know, a lot of parents they see that adoption in there as a concurrent plan, and they just freak out early on. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure you have to, unless you know, if you if you come in at an early review hearing or a dispositional hearing, and the parents have disappeared or not been visiting or not doing anything, exactly. you know, then I don't, I wouldn't worry too much about scaring them. Um, but if, if they're doing, um, you know, I don't think you have to put it in right at the get go. But anytime, you know, kids are out of, kids either get moved home pretty quick or it's stretching out and concurrent planning ought to be going as, as, as soon as you have a good sense that this case may not be clearly reunification. Um, there's some real struggles going on and you ought to be doing concurrent planning. But, um, but I asked these, these these kinds of questions if, they, if I get a recommendation for concurrent planning. Um, and I, uh, I, I approve concurrent planning all the time. I generally, and this is just my practice, I will approve a plan of guardianship if, if the permanency report or the re case planning court report says the parents support it at that point. They are willing to do a guardianship with their sister. I'll approve that as the sole permanency plan if it's where the parent testifies, yes, I'm willing to do a guardianship. <laughs> or if the evidence is the parent's wanting to relinquish and um, wants to, uh, is willing to do that, then I approve just adoption or guardianship if, the, if I got a clear indication of the parent's on board with that. Dave? Does the permanency hearing, does it require you to approve a plan? I mean, when you say, I find, I, I make no finding at this time as, well, as to whether or not the permanency objective is the most appropriate. Had your hearing. Well, okay, here's the statute. Um, the, in terms of the finding required by the law. court, the law. Here we go with the, law. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, the court's order shall include, shall is that one of those words that I take seriously, 
um, as opposed to may, which is <laughs> in case you're more legally. Shall include a finding regarding the appropriateness of the permanency plan determined for the child, and shall include, and I'm not saying I always do this, whether and if applicable, when the child will be returned to the parents. And if the permanency plan is kids go home today, I put that in my order, they're going home today. Refer to the state for filing of a petition for termination of parental rights. I don't generally say that in my order. I should, if, if they, they're saying we're, re, we're preparing a request or I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, place for adoption, uh, referred for guardianship. <laughs> so you are required, and then in cases where the state agency has documented to the court a compelling reason for determining that it would not be in the best interest of the child to return home, this, I hate this phrase because I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's well, we don't have any state I wish they would fix this because I think it's confusing. Um, yes. Oh, we do. <laughs> Tammy. Oh, <laughs> well, bring that up. That this is very confusing. But in, in cases where the, the court report documents that there's a compelling reason for basically none of the above, I think that's the intent. Um, and then it kind of falls off. Um, but. You know, there are occasions where you have a older child um, that uh, is in a very stable foster home but does not want to be uh, adopted, doesn't want to have a guardianship, um, and they're not going to move them because they're, they're going to thrive. And you know, so I think that kind of covers those situations. Um, is that a yes or no? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you got to do it. You got to make a finding, one or the other, or none of the above, because of a compelling reason. Steve. Yeah, yeah I think there's case law that says that that is not a final order. Uh, would you agree with that? I would. I would agree with that. And, and so that's kind of helpful to us well, because we can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to get to the appellate issues and. The interesting thing about the appellate issues is I did my research and it's like all these cases have my name on them. <laughs> Either as a county attorney or a judge. And there are there's none that was reversed on so none of them were final orders, so they didn't get a chance. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Don't you see a conflict with B? Well, yeah, and, and that's why I, I never order, this is just, <coughs> judges have done this, um, I never order a case to be referred to the county attorney or the department's legal for filing a petition for termination. I just, I do, I think that's a constitutional issue of separation of powers. But I know there was an appeal of that issue, because I think it was Judge Rouse and Dutton, who must have been sitting in Douglas County, he ordered a case to be referred to the county attorney for filing the termination motion, and it was not a final order. So yeah, the, the decision. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was not a final order. Um, I want to go to that because I know we're getting. Well, we got. I'm concerned the judge may have already prejudged the case. Well, exactly. Exactly. Is it a mandate, or are you just referring it? I, I think yeah. to, to, I mean, that's, uh, you could probably be a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It makes it sound like a mandate. You can thread the needle by saying I'm approving a permanency plan of adoption and the, the agencies indicated they're preparing a termination request for the county attorney. Uh, side issue, the permanency report that um, we're getting in Lancaster County and anybody who wants to see a draft of one, I'll, I'll accept, you know, I'll black out people's names. Just email me. And I'll, I'll make sure we send you one that's being used because they are helpful. And actually, our county attorney told me yesterday that she finds the permanency reports that the caseworkers are preparing as, as real helpful in terms of preparing the, the motion to terminate criminal rights. They sort of, mm -hmm. in a condensed fashion, summarize all the evidence that mm -hmm. would support termination. So, what's your thought as a judge um, on guardianship versus the adoption for younger kids? If you have a situation where you have family that, you know, maybe adoption may not be the best way to go and we have someone willing to do a guardianship, parents willing to agree, but then we have to run the problem of HHS says, no, that's not our policy. If they're under this age, we're not going to approve a guardianship. 
I mean, what you're I haven't, I haven't had to purpose. weigh in on that a whole lot. I've had a few cases where that's been worked out by the litigants. Um, and, you know, I would just tell you that when, when it has been an issue, the department, my experience seems to ultimately cave. Pressure, <laughs> but it's a relative that says I don't. I, I I'm committed to this child, but I don't want to. You know, I had one with a mentally ill mother, um, and the child was with an aunt, and that was a baby. I mean, that child was removed from the hospital, um, and the department eventually caved and let the family do a guardianship mm -hmm. because they wanted to preserve the mother's sense of having a role with the child. But it's it hasn't ever been. Um, something I've had to really say no, yay or no, uh, yay or nay on in terms of that being appropriate. So well, that, I, I guess say. that's the thing. I don't see where the department has yeah. that authority because I, I make kind of a not law-based ruling when I say I don't care what the department says. <laughs> I've got to find what's in the best interest of the child. They, they're entitled to disagree with me. And they can get a three-judge panel if they want to. But if it's overwhelming that I can get this kid in something permanent. And, and sometimes I think the department is looking for the judge. If the judge approves the permanency <coughs> plan of guardianship, that may, that may result yeah, in I, them we caving to run up or, against the problem a lot. But they're this age, we're not approving it. Or we have, they'll give us a speech of how we have to go through this exceptions approval. And it takes another, you know. And I've had it come up in that situation and then where... You have the kids' counselors and stuff. They want termination, and I have a counselor. I mean, I, th I think there. Are, I think judges can approve a permanency plan of guardianship, and I suppose the department could appeal that if, if they disagree with it. Um, I just can't tell you more than that. I haven't yeah. had really squarely presented to me yet, judge. If does, does the judge ultimately make a decision on a permanency plan based on the evidence, or do you have to? get a motion from a litigant in order to make a change or some kind. In other words, if if, the, if if you're reviewing a case and you think, well, I think, you know, the permanency plan of X would be appropriate that nobody's asked for it, do you have to wait for somebody to ask for it? Or can the judge just make the finding based on the evidence presented that the permanency plan should either be X or change to X? I think you can, I mean, the permanence, the statute clearly requires you to approve at least a 12 months and then annually thereafter. Right, but it's but, talking but about it, approving a plan and, and that at least suggests that somebody has to present it for you to approve. And so I, that's always confused me as to whether or not the judge on their own can say. Well, I, every case report I see says what their right. permanency plan is. So I think that's probably enough. I mean, I, I don't know. But, but I, I guess it's more circumstances. If, it's, if, if, oh, if the judge thinks, yeah, that's not a good idea. I want to go this way. Yeah. Oh, I think, think I think implicit in, okay. in not approving the department's plan, you can approve it. Okay. Um, appeals from permanency plan orders. You know, th this is an sort of an interesting issue in terms of, and, and I'll just be as candid as I can. Sometimes I've had a case where I've thought, you know, the, per the, the, the most likely permanency plan. And in fact, Judge Johnson, who I sat in his uh, courtroom last week or so, I noticed he makes a finding of what's the more he may make a concurrent permanency plan finding, but he, he designates one more likely than the other, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I, when I am approving a concurrent permanency plan of reunification, but also adoption or a guardianship, um, I continue to order a rehabilitative plan that allows the parents uh, to comply with it. And I, the, the case that I had that, uh, two cases now that have gone up on appeal from my, um, <coughs> once when I was a prosecutor and one as a judge, have said that that's not a final order. As long as you're continuing to provide the parent with the services um, under a reunification plan, even if you approve a plan other than that, uh, or approve a concurrent plan, um, and actually the case that was just appealed, it's in Ray Taylor something, um, but I approved a permanency plan of adoption for these kids. These kids have been out of care for a long time. Um, but I continue to order a rehabilitative plan for the parent to participate in, and she continues to push to pursue reunification. And the court, uh, court of things said that's not a final order. And the earlier case was a similar one where the judge had found a uh, plan of independent living for youth, but continued to order 
services for the parents basically said that was not a final order because the parents really they had, there's no substantial right effect as long as a parent still has a vehicle to pursue reunification and up to that. now I think if you made a, per, a permanency finding of uh, permanency plan finding of adoption and cut off parents access to services I think that's a different question I think that might affect a, reason, a substantial right of the parent that might be a final order and the reason I've always been hesitant to do that is quite frankly it's going to slow things down a lot. You've got a six month to a year appeal process, and if you think a motion to terminate parental rights might be filed rather quickly and bring the issue to a head for <coughs> decision, I don't necessarily want to add another year before that can even be considered. So, you think you'd get away with this because that's the way I get around it. I, the minute somebody says terminate, I suspend all proceedings and give the state 10 days to file the termination. Or we're going to come back and complete the permanency here. I just suspend it. That's, say, okay. that's an interesting because uh, that's not a final order. I, I know that when I have a uh, you know, termination <clears throat> filed, um, if I've got a hearing, a review hearing, or a permanency hearing, or uh, an exception hearing, any of those things scheduled, um, and I am not outside the six month, I don't run into that six month review issue. I'll continue it until the resolution of the permanency the termination hearing because you know you change any part of that plan that could be construed as a substantial right of the parent and you, you open up an avenue for appeal and for delay and you know, sometimes that's that's what happens so I just try to avoid that if I can. Have you ever ordered that reasonable efforts are no longer necessary? I have um, and I uh, uh, <coughs> case where I approved a permanency plan of guardianship, which is never going to happen because these are kids that are pretty old now and they don't want a guardianship. They've got a real allegiance to their parents, but, but lower, fun very low functioning parents. But it was, you know, it was five or six years into a case and I just, when I finally made that call at some point, I, I, I didn't <coughs> order the department. I mean, they, they have visitation with the children, but they don't have I'm not ordering the department to continue to provide the mother with drug treatment. She's had some substance abuse issues. I'm not even ordering drug testing. I still have a, a rehabilitative plan that parents can do, but it's all of their own initiative and arrangements. So I've done it. And in part because that was a case that I thought, you know, if they appeal that, you know, I'm not losing anything with the time in terms of because there wasn't going to be a termination final or guardianship or anything to but I generally try to, at least until the actual termination is heard and decided, try to provide that rehabilitative plan so that you know, we don't build in some delays to the permanency for children. One way or the other, I don't always terminate my rights, but I like to make sure it's When you're doing the concurrent plan of adoption or guardianship with the concurrent plan of reunification, with a substantially similar court reported case plan than it, that it was prior to the term of the permanency hearing. What is the meaningful distinction of a permanency hearing then? <coughs> because I think I've gone through a long process of thinking permanency exception, I don't really care. If, if my clients do what they need to do, if the prosecutor's not going to follow the judge's directive and exceptions of permanency, it doesn't matter as long as the prosecutor is not going down the termination road. So if you have concurrent planning, what is the meaningful distinction of a permanency? What's the meaningful distinction? What, what should a permanency hearing be? I mean, what's the difference between saying it's adoption, it's, it's concurrent plan of reunification? If, if you're not changing the services, to me it, it almost should be a, it, it, like a purge plan on an order to show cause. Okay, I told you to do this stuff for a year, you haven't necessarily done it, but this is really your last warning. If you don't do it three months from now, you're probably going to get a, a termination file next year. To me, it, it could be an opportunity to say, and this is it. I'm going to order adoption. I'm going to thank your services, and I'm going to give you indication that this is what's going to happen. But if you continue with all the same services, what what really is a permanency hearing? Well, it, it, my suggestion, again, is something that you take away is whether you're a judge or a litigant, uh, a party is that you you ask for time frames. I mean, you said it, you, you ask for some specifics as opposed to just 
more of the same and with those time frames and specifics than an actual change you know and maybe it's um, you know it's 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 aspirational I'm not saying but I would say to you John that if you do that and I because I've had these discussions with, with myself if I do that if I cut off all services and I'm not part of it is you know the department's not asking to, you to approve a plan that does that in part, I guess, because that's their administrative, uh, their, their regs don't, don't allow them to do that until rights have been terminated. So you've got to have somebody showing that that's not in the child's best interest. But, you know, you do that, and, and any parent who doesn't want their rights uh, terminated is going to appeal. Well, because there is a substantial right in terms of the right to have received services while your parental rights are still intact, I think. It does trigger a substantial right, and then you're going to add a, a year to the case before the issue of uh, uh, termination or probably reunification as well. Well, I think it's a good time issue. for the, the lawyer to have to come to Jesus with the client and say, you had 12 months. <laughs> well, and, and that's... You've got three months left where it's really termination. That's time. one of the things that I would urge judges as well as lawyers to, to be doing, and I'm doing a lot more of it from the bench than I did when I started, and that is telling people every time I've got, a, I've got on my docket sheet, when those kids were removed, when the 12 months is up, when the 15 months is up. I've got all those dates on my docket sheet for every case. And I say to the parents, in fact, I said to somebody last week, you know, these kids have been out of the home for five months. It's time to stop messing around. But 12 months, and I give them the date, I remind them again, because it's in the adjudication order, but I remind them again, we're going to be in here to decide what, you know, the permanent home for your children should be. And, um, so the, those time frames should be driven home all the time, and I, I would urge you to reference that permanency hearing. Uh, because really, when kids are going to go home, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the mea culpa, because we got, you all broke out and got your stats from your regions, and, you know, Lancaster County is terrible in terms of kids that are ultimately reunified with their families. 12 months is, is our average. And statewide, it's seven months. So, you know, we're, we're not, most of our kids are not being returned until the time when we're supposed to have this permanency hearing. And the resource guidelines says, you know, kids that have not been returned home in 12 months should be just a, a tiny exception of your cases if they're going to be returned home. And there ought to be extraordinary circumstances. And well, the reality is that there are sort of ordinary circumstances. So um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done for all of us. But, when you do have kids that have been out of care for 12 months um, for permanency hearings, I would just urge you to try to make them as meaningful as possible. And, and the judge can, can do it by asking a lot of questions and getting kids <coughs> used to being asked a lot of questions about, okay, where are we going from here? And what are you doing? Let's see if I can miss some stuff. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Her. I'm sorry, you guys didn't get my back. Don't you think ultimately at some point, we hear a lot that it's the judge, this is judge driven, judge driven, but at some point it really is attorney driven. Because even if you adopt as a primary permanency plan adoption or it's a concurrent plan, unless someone else, the guardian of item or the county attorney does something, it just sits there. Because I don't know what more the judge can do other than keep bringing it back every month and see what's different to me. And then after a while, we get tired of looking at each other. Yeah, but uh, at some point, that's You're right, just with regards stuff. to activity and permanency. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've, I've toyed with the idea, and I have done it a little bit, not much. But for cases, it's, I'm thinking, why is somebody not bringing this to a head as in filing or returning the kids home. It's like, okay, let's review it every the last Friday of every month at four o'clock, you know? <laughs> so there they are. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> or, or setting it on a 30 day review. And I know not everybody has the luxury of calendars that allow for that, and I don't really either. But it's it's to basically, you know, it's, it's to keep it at the front of people's minds of why aren't we moving in one direction or another case. Um, yeah, my last screen, and then I'll go back if I miss some or if we've got any more time or I'll take more questions, but 
I don't know how many of you have had these cases, but I got them. And um, there are cases where that is at 12 months or sometimes it's like 24 months. We've got cases that are just stagnant or it's stalemate. They're just not going anywhere. And, the, and they're hard because the parents are still visiting their children and maybe participating in some services, but nobody's got any confidence that these parents can reunify with their children. And they've just been a, you know, one, one thing that I've been trying, and I won't say with much success, but I've been trying to get the department to order, which to arrange some evaluations and assessments of the parents by, <coughs> by psychologists or somebody willing to sort of look at all the, the work that's been done with the parent, all the visitation or services, and, and call it. You know, can these parent people independently parent on a full-time basis? Um, because that's sort of what you need to move forward. That if they can't, or if they can, then put them home and put in lots of in-home supports and try it. Um, but those are those are the tough cases, and I uh, I just would urge you to explore with your case over what type of evaluation by uh, a mental health professional could maybe get to the core issue of, you know, can these, these parents parent full time on an independent basis or not? So that you have, because that's why your county attorneys or guardian or items are not filing anything, is they feel like, I don't have the evidence of the parents kind of doing what the court's ordered them to do. So what's going to happen? Aren't those types of cases, too, where the milestones are really important, where you say, okay, we've got this level, it's not good enough. I mean, that's great, but it's not good enough. We've got to get to, we've got to be able to actually be ready to have kids come home by this age. It, aren't those the type of cases yeah, where those, the milestones really are Yeah, critical? and looking back, those are cases where, you know, I, I think they would also be served by, at the outset, a good evaluation of the parents and their their uh, capabilities and what type of services if, if they're not just completely incapable of parenting you know just way too low functioning to even you know be left in the same room with the child without someone attending it but getting good evals at the outset with, with recommendations as to what services are the best to put in place and then put them in place and then even whether it's that person that then reevaluates the parent down the road or somebody else, um, I mean, those are the best way to deal with those cases. But I suspect you all are like we are. Unfortunately, find ourselves a year or two into them going, gosh, what are we doing? Can you, uh, do you think then you can really find termination under the best interest standard that we have to also bring when you have a case like that? Where they're doing enough, they have that relationship, but we can't put the kids home. I mean, should we really be looking at a termination, or should at that point we be saying, okay, we really need to try some alternative to get them some permanency? But because I mean, can you really meet that best interest? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the, the response that one of the Judge Key I think says. Okay, it depends. <laughs> okay, it does. It depends okay. on how old the kids are, where they're, whether they're with relatives, whether they're one and two year olds. I mean, there, there are tons of, of factors. I mean, I, I don't have a huge leap for best interest with very young children and, and parents that just, through no fault of their own maybe, or through lots of effort, just can't do it. Saying that, you know, they, they should, they're entitled to a young life, permanent family. But older kids with relatives, that may be one where you know, it's a different, you, you come to a different way of so it depends. Other uh, questions? Sure. Um, I think the first peer review board just kind of goes out for all the good. Is when our reviews really correspond with a permanency or even an exception hearing, is there anything additional that we can put in our reports? Because we always tend to address permanency because that's one of our goals to make sure the kids are moving forward and, and serving. <coughs> But when you're, you're getting to that point, our board members, you know, their hackles start going up. Why? What are we going to do? How does this kid either go home? Is there more information or, or anything additional that we can help provide the judges to make those decisions to get these cases moving one way or the other? Well, one thing, and, and they are doing this in our permanency reports, and believe it or not, I used to never get it or rarely get it, um, is I don't know whether the 
the child's uh, current placement is willing to provide permanency. That's the other thing that the caregiver information <coughs> comes at the very end, they do that. And we used to not even get that, ever. And so I was, you know, a lot of times acting on assumptions that this was an adoptive home. Um, but sometimes you don't know it. So certainly, um, if the foster parents are participating in that process, knowing what their intentions are, or willingness is in terms of providing currency, I think it would be helpful. Permanent alternative has been identified. Yeah. It's that information. Absolutely. And any, uh, you know, again, going to time frame, it's just any input you want to provide in terms of, okay, we support reunification, but, you know, we think this ought to happen by this time. I sometimes I love cases where the child child is removed <coughs> and they're placed back with the parents and they're removed again and they're placed back with parents. When you're setting your permanency hearings, do you just keep that date in place just in case, or do you reset it each time that child is removed? Um, good question. And that that does get to be messy when you've had the in and out and in and out of how do you calculate the 12 months and then the 15 out of 22. Um, I, I keep that permanency date out there for a while. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a lot of cases where kids go back home and then get yanked again. Um, so, but we usually cancel it at some point if the kids have been home. I, I guess, quite frankly, you know, the hearing after the kids are returned home, um, if they're still there and I'm setting a six-month review, if it coincides with what that permanency review hearing was already out there, we'll do that. If not, we'll cancel it. But. Um, it is something to be aware of is, um, you know, you sometimes have to restart the clock. And, um, but I think if they're home, I don't, you know, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head um, in terms of the federal standards. I think it's something like if they're home for less than six months, it's considered a trial placement and, and it's not a home placement. If they are out, if they're home for six months, then the clock sort of completely starts over. I think resets. I think that's right. Um, but um, any other questions? This is good. Twelve fifteen. Great group. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.